there's a lot of people with elevated cholesterol and LDL and all those sort of things. And uh, one of my favorite snacks, well, I probably ate them every day, was Oreo cookies. Oh, yeah. Can you just give us the one minute uh, story on uh, the importance of Oreo <laughs> cookies in your health and wellness? Yes. Uh, uh, disclaimer or uh, caveat I was never paid by Oreo or any big food company to do this experiment. But um, when we were early on in our research around lean mass hyperresponders, so people who go low carb and see their LDL skyrocket, I won't get into the whole mechanism. It's not pertinent to the takeaway of the story. But bottom line was this was an incredibly fascinating area of science and medicine. And I thought this deserves to be explored. This needs attention. And despite pumping out papers, we had like nine or 10 at the time, including meta-analyses of randomized control trials. So talk about hierarchy of evidence. We're like, you know, sitting on the top of that pyramid. People don't talk about it. And they're not talking about it, again, because of, I think, the incentive structures. I won't go back to that. But that just, you know, this wasn't in the scope of curiosity because it wasn't in the conventional framework. And that ticked me off. It ticked me off that I'm like, this is incredible. I'm not saying me, but, like, this could be the basis of a Nobel Prize someday. This is a phenomenal group of patients. I happen to be one of those patients, like, in that population – that is the exception that could prove the new rule. We have so much about cardiology and lipidology we could learn from these patients, their weird lipid dynamics. Why is nobody paying attention to this? And so, you know, I don't have, I, I had ba barely any media presence at that time, like you know, 5,000 followers on Twitter or something. And I don't have a lot of money. So what can I do to get attention? And I'm like, you know, what I do have, a little bit cheeky. I have a doctorate. I'm at Harvard, so I have branding. Can I design a stunt? And let me be clear, this was intended to be a stunt to draw attention to this phenomenon. And so I came up with the Oreo versus statin experiment because I thought understanding the physiology as I did, I could develop a metabolic context where I could eat Oreo cookies and use them to lower my cholesterol. But not just like, oh, I'm gonna do this and say I did it and put it up in a blog. No, no, no. I know how to dot my I's and cross my T's because I'm a cheeky little academic. So what I did was I designed a protocol. I got a very senior lipidologist, his name is Professor William Cromwell, maybe people know him, to consult, help me design the study. I have my primary care clinician ordering all my labs. I went to Harvard's Institutional Review Board and said, hey, I'm doing this. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to do it. Please know that I'm going to do this. Please grant me an Listen. IRB exemption letter. Did it all right. Then I did the experiment and was able to show in a crossover study, so an Oreo intervention, washout period, statin intervention, high dose statin, 20 milligrams of Crestor for six weeks, that the Oreos were better, actually more than twice as powerful at lowering my cholesterol, my LDL cholesterol, as a statin. And then we published the paper. So bottom line is, yes, I did an experiment where I used Oreo cookies to lower my cholesterol more powerfully than the most profitable drug class in history. And that achieve the aim I set out to achieve, got people talking. And, you know, it started a conversation with academics, with clinicians, among the general population. And the conversation was not, Oreos are good for you. The conversation is, oh, wow, this is interesting. Why did this happen? Let's talk about it more. So those were the discussions we have. And, and I, I like to highlight that example. And I, I'm grateful the, the stunt went off so well, because it plays into this idea that we've been talking about of, you know, incentive structures. Like what gets attention? What do I need to do to steer the conversation the way I want to steer it? I don't have Pfizer money, so you need to do other things. And I always want people to come back when they're digesting media, be it information from me, you, legacy media, healthcare media. What are the incentive structures driving this? It'll often give people a lot of insight. And so, you know, sometimes things come off as clickbaity because guess what? Engagement is a currency and you kind of have to pay homage to that altar. And, and then the question really is like, well, what is the depth? Is there value added here? Is this something that makes you think and evolves your perspective? Is the person talking actually willing to engage you with an open mind? In the end, it's up to the individual to decide if the message being propagated is valuable. But yes. I lowered my cholesterol with Oreo cookies. Yes, it was a clickbait stunt. That was the intention. And it was incredibly successful in its aim to bring attention to a fascinating corner of lipidology that deserves more attention. And now it's getting it. So by doing that and lowering your 
LDL cholesterol, do you think you lowered your risk of heart disease? I'm not going to answer that question because I think that's the provocative element of the internet. And, and, and what I'm, because here's the thing. I know when that headline runs, people want to resolve an implicit tension. Oreos, healthy or unhealthy? I think we all agree they're unhealthy. Lowering LDL, conventionally thought of as healthy. So unhealthy intervention, quote unquote, healthy outcome, those things butt heads. They're a paradox. And if there's a paradox, it means there's something we don't understand. That was the point. The point was to create that cognitive dissonance, not to solve it for people, but say, hey, this is weird. We need to study this. How many cookies a day did you have? 12. 12 cookies a day. Had you yeah. just done one cookie a day, might you have had the same outcome? No, I think. Well, we don't, we don't know that. We, we don't uh, know that. I, I mean, I'm, sure. I'm. Right, right. So, I mean, we don't know that. You, you're you're suspecting it wouldn't be, but I guess I'm always wondering, how does LDL cholesterol cause heart disease? I mean, the conventional perspective is the um, response to retention model, lipid heart hypothesis. So loss of LDL gets into the artery wall, causes inflammation, plaque grows. It's the conventional model. That's a theory, correct? Yeah, it's a theory. Right. So hypothesis theory in much of science and medicine works on theories. And I'm just curious about your storytelling and how storytelling may change the paradigm of science. Yeah. Well, I think models need evolution. And so this idea that high LDL will just cause heart disease, almost like high LDL is the disease, is overly simplistic. And the current lipid heart hypothesis is not a complete model. That's not to say it's wrong, per se. It's just not complete. And we know this because we have people who buck the system. I have a family member with an LDL of over 400 who happens to be in her 60s and has high, had high LDL her whole life. And in coronary CT and geography, her arteries are crystal clear. That does not align with the current paradigm. Now, you could just wave, wave your hand and say, oh, that's a fluke. That's a one-off. I'm like, so what? It, it doesn't matter. The outliers are the ones we need to study to understand the mechanism better. So it's not one of the – so the hot take, that's not at all a hot take. The most controversial thing I can say that's not actually not at all controversial in cardiology is different people have a different relationship between LDL and ApoB exposure and plaque progression. That's known. The same amount of ApoB LDL exposure does not convert to the same amount of plaque in different people. So the question is, why? That's, you know, we could have a conversation for four hours about that. But I think, you know, the high level, which we both agree on, is metabolic context of the individual matters. And if we're broadening this, you always always without, I think, singular exception, need to look at a given marker in context. Any good endocrinologist, a hormone doctor will tell you, there's actually no normal lab. There's just appropriate or inappropriate for the context. So what is the context? What are the other lab markers? What is the patient's history? What is their diet and lifestyle? Context, context, context always matters.